Chapter One of the Mind the Paint Girl. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Adrian Stevens. The Mind the Paint Girl by Lewis Tracy. Chapter One. A May Morning. The music of the band came nearer. The cold streams were marching from Chelsea to relieve the grenadiers. Strollers in the park, loungers in Pall Mall and St James's Street seemed to quicken visibly under the lilt and rhythm of the lively air. A crowd, mostly drawn from the provinces and overseas, had gathered already on the pavement, either beneath the wall of Marlborough House or on the south of Palace Square and even the case-hardened Cockneys, who happened to be passing, hurried to watch the daily pageant of guard-mounting. The oncoming band acted on them as a magnet acts on steel filings. As it approached, each human atom became active. Two men, neither of whom had seen the other, turned out of Pall Mall about the same moment, but on opposite sides of Marlborough Gate. The elder of the pair, unmistakably the type of retired soldier, which ranges from colonel to field marshal, had just quitted a club in St James's Street. If hair and moustache were white, his figure was trim and erect, and at the martial strains of the band his shoulders unconsciously squared themselves, and his face lost an expression of settled melancholy, singularly out of keeping with spruce attire and military bearing. The younger man, tall and strongly built, was a captain in a line battalion, but walked with the air and swing of a cavalryman. He came from Pall Mall, and a casual glance at the sentry in front of Marlborough House in order to learn, from the colour of the cockade and the arrangement of buttons on the scarlet tunic, what regiment had been on duty during the previous twenty-four hours, cost him an opportunity of recognising an old friend. London gives or withholds such haphazard encounters with callous indifference. In ordinary conditions, these two might not have met a second time within the year, but now the band, with blood-stirring clash of brass and cymbals, had wheeled out of the park into the Walpent Road, and alert policemen were shepherding the onlookers into compact masses. Again the band wheeled some staccato orders, made themselves heard above the din of drums and instruments. The old guard's rifles clattered to the present. The new guard became two solid lines of black and red, faced to the left, and moved in toward the square. Then the crowd broke, eager to gain a few yards closer view of the spectacle, and this reshuffling of its units brought the two army men side by side. Hello, Nico. Hello, Colonel. Their hands met with a ready clasp of friendship. My wife tells me you were in town. She saw you last night in the stalls at the Pandora, so we were expecting you to call, said the veteran. Yes, of course, this afternoon, without fail, said Nico Jays. Nico to his intimates. But Captain Nicholas Jays of the North Devons to the wider world. The CO gave me ten days district leave, and I reached town from the Curragh yesterday, just in time to dress and eat before going to the theatre. Colonel the Honourable Arthur Stidolf, for all that he was a society man to the tips of his well-manicured fingers, had an incurable trick of allowing his face to betray his thoughts. A slight frown of bewilderment now chased away the smile which had welcomed Jay's. Ten days in May, he exclaimed. I had a notion you were keen on soldiering, Nico. So I am, sir. Nobody more so. Yet even Napoleon kicked when he was sent from Paris to Ozon, and the Curra is a deuce of a hole after Aldershot. Stidolf snorted disapproval. Put your profession first, my boy, and a jolly long first before the Pandora Theatre and its frills, he said. You'll hardly believe it, knowing me as you do, but time was when I would have jumped down my junior captain's throat if he had asked for ten days' leave in the very height of the drill season. Sorry, Nico. 
for the tired old eyes had detected a flush of embarrassment beneath the tan of his hearer's cheeks. That's a beastly inhospitable remark, and you know I don't mean it in that sense. Just for a moment I put myself in loco parentis. Perhaps Satan rebuking sin would be a better simile, because your father died in harness, whereas I, well, here I am, tiptoeing among the mob to gaze at my own regiment. Dash it all! It's a fine morning. Let's talk of something else. Jay's had his own reasons for falling in readily with the suggested change of topic. Most of the men here are new to me, he said. Who is the grenadier subaltern with the colours? Oh, that's Farncombe, nice boy, son of the Earl of Godalming. Why can't Farncombe? Yes. Lucky chap. Soldiering is made easy for him. So it was for me, yet I had to chuck the service soon after I got command of the battalion. Then Jays could have bitten his tongue viciously, if that could have withdrawn the unhappy remark, for it was an open secret that Stidolf had been refused an extension, sure preliminary to a district and a major generalship, because he had married Dolly Ensor, a minor star of the Pandora Galaxy. The Honourable Mrs. Arthur Stidolf might have averted the deadly effect of the mésalliance had she been sufficiently plastic to adapt herself to the ways and usages of society, but she was a good deal more of a Pandora girl after marriage than before. She regarded her rise in the social scale as justifying a loudness of manner which the stage manager had sternly repressed on the boards of the theatre, and, as the direct outcome, her husband was shelved professionally. Not that Mrs. Stidolf cared a jot. Married to the brother of an earl, and fairly well provided with money, so long as she remained within the four walls of the law, she could not be ousted wholly from the sacred enclosures of the upper ten thousand. Fully content, she tripped joyously through life, and the ex-colonel of the guards gained as Dolly Ensor's husband, a celebrity denied to his military career. In his confusion, the younger man could find nothing to say. As for Stidolf, he was gazing hungrily at the little group of officers who had now broken up into pairs and were strolling to and fro while sergeants and corporals marched reliefs to the various posts in the precincts of the palaces. The band had become an orchestra, and the conductor, after submitting a programme to the senior captain, raised his baton. When Jays heard the opening bars of a selection, his face brightened. "'By Jove, Colonel,' he said, "'these fellows are bang up to date. "'They are playing the Duchess of Brixton, "'and it was only produced a week ago.' "'The older man came back from his daydream. "'Yes,' he said, "'I was there. "'Mrs. Stidolf is an inveterate first-nighter, "'and rather a pretty opera, "'but while I don't pose as an expert in such things, "'it struck me as lacking the one song "'or the outstanding bit of acting.' which usually supplies the clue to a musical comedy. Oh, I thought it was capital, protested Jaynes. His companion laughed mirthlessly. <laughs> you would, he said. You are young enough to watch the twirling feet of the pretty girls rather than pay heed to such trifles as plot and melody. The rotten thing about the stage, commented Jays earnestly, is the way genuine talent is burked. I can't say how it is with the men, but where the girls are concerned, an actress depends far more on having a pull with the manager, or with some city magnate who is financing the show, than on real ability in her work. I have heard that said a great many times, Nico, yet what little experience I have goes to prove the exact contrary. The managerial or financial pull you speak of will never succeed in filling the house. Grit and genius tell on the stage, exactly as they command the prizes in every other profession. Why, I could give you a list of names that would surprise you, and in every instance a woman has forced herself to the front by strenuous effort, backed up, of course, by a good voice and good looks. Look at... Is he governor? Broke in a small man, with ginger hair and a bristling moustache, who had been striving vainly to catch the strains of the new opera, if you wouldn't mind. 
and Colonel Stidolf laughed quite cheerfully. I apologise, my friend, he said. Doing anything, Neko? Come to my club. We'll have a jaw and an early lunch. Sorry, I have an appointment farther west. Jays consulted his watch. I must take a cab, he added. I had plenty of time to stroll there when I started, but I did not realise how the minutes were slipping along. And the years. Don't forget the years. See you at tea? Yes, sir. Meanwhile, my best wishes to Mrs. Stodolf. They parted. Carrot nudged his neighbour. Bloy me, he gurgled. I didn't catch his name the first time. An honourable he is. Dolly answers husband. Fancy me chipping the old cock like that. But he ain't so dead stuck on the stage, is he, Charlie? Knows a damn sight too much about it, said Chorley, who was by way of being a philosopher. Jays was using no polite fiction when he spoke of taking a cab. He seized the first that presented itself, a hansom, as it happened, the taxi meter being just at the beginning of its triumphal descent on London, and told the driver to rush him to Hyde Park Corner. The hands of the clock over the lodgekeeper's house stood exactly at eleven as he sprang to the pavement, and he hurried across the row with an air of urgency, fully explained by the cheerful impatience with which he was greeted by a pretty girl awaiting him near the statue of Achilles. "'Caught you tripping at last! You are late, Nico!' she cried. "'Only one minute!' he protested, his somewhat heavy face brightening with joy at sight of her. "'I'm at Colonel Stidolf, and I couldn't in decency hurry away, especially as he was lecturing me.' "'What about? About me?' "'No, Lily, thank God. He has never even heard your name.' "'But, Nico, why so serious? Why should you offer up thanks because I am a Miss Nobody of nowhere whom no one ever even heard of, as you say?' Evidently the two were bent on some more definite object than a mere stroll in the park, for they had turned in the direction of Stanhope Gate without any discussion as to the route they should follow. The girl, tall, slim and quietly attired, moved with an easy, supple elegance. She was young, not yet twenty, and youth is naturally graceful, but the expert eye would determine at a glance that she was a dancer, and in all probability an uncommonly good one. A blue serge costume, neat gloves and boots, and a hat by no means flamboyant in style or size, showed that Miss Lily Paradell, though only a coryphée in the Pandora Theatre, did not share the average taste of her class for bizarre garments. Despite her youth, she had graduated in the hard academy of pantomime and music hall, and her companion's fervour with regard to her professional insignificance was hardly justified, since it was no small achievement that she should have won her way already through the most closely guarded stage door in London. The rounded brows over the big, earnest eyes she had raised to her escort's face showed that she was surprised, perhaps a trifle resentful of his tone, and a slight wave of colour heightened and glorified her somewhat pale cheeks. Always pretty, Lily Paradell had suddenly become beautiful, and, had Captain Jays been more finely observant, he might have made the delightful discovery that a bright intelligence was her greatest charm, but he could only feel that he had somehow struck a false note, and he hastened to correct the blunder. "'I didn't mean that, Lily!' And you're merely teasing me by pretending that you think otherwise, he said. In fact, poor old Stidolf's remarks ran in a precisely contrary sense. I was grumbling about the difficulty a really smart girl encounters in making a start, in raising herself above the common level, that is, but he stuck out that the stage does really offer la carrière ouverte au talent. How are you getting on with your French? Well, Enough to understand that, she said gleefully. And your friend is right, Nico. Not that he, let me see, didn't he marry Dolly Ensa? Yes. 
Why do you say yes in that way? Because the Honourable Arthur used to be such a smart chap in my time at Sandhurst, and now he's a back number. He should have done more with his life than simply marry a woman who happened to be a bit of a celebrity. Why didn't he make a career for himself? Happily, Jays had tact enough to check the imminent explanation. He rather lost touch with soldiering, I fancy, he said. But the girl's sharp ears had caught the pause, the careful weighing of the reply before it was uttered. Was it because he married an actress? she demanded, quickly. Good gracious, no. There's no bar to social progress nowadays. Some mischievous thought danced in the girl's eyes, which continued to search her friend's sunburned face inquisitively. Lots of our high-kickers marry lords, which is a cut above an honourable, I suppose. She seemed to be musing aloud, but there was no uncertainty in the succeeding question, which was very much to the point. Nico, what would you say if I made a hit, and all the giddy young gadders about town began chasing me? May I smoke? said Chase. Yes, but answer me. I would be pleased, of course, and frantically jealous. Equally, of course. Now, let's chuck problems and admire the flowers. We cross here. The beds begin at the other side of Stanhope Gate. Nico, I'm serious. As to the hit, at any rate, I have been given my chance. What do you mean? Has that silly little ass, Lionel Groper, been filling your head with nonsense? The stalwart captain's voice had grown harsh. He knew that this charming girl was flirting with him innocently, leading him on, and he hated himself for the miserable truckling to convention which held him back from the supreme step of asking her to be his wife. "'Please don't call Uncle Lal rude names,' said Lily, though the tremendous news which she could no longer retain choked down the resentment she would certainly have expressed at any other time. The ill-tempered reference to Roper was quite unwarranted, since he had proved to be a real friend to herself and her mother. "'I am thoroughly in earnest. Maury Cooling, our business manager, you know, was growling the other night about the lack of go in the Duchess of Brixton, and Vincent Bland, the composer, he really is a duck. All the girls love him remembered that I sang a little ballad rather well one night in the Canterbury, and, what do you think, he has written me a song, full stage, with chorus. I'm rehearsing it today for the first time, and I really do believe it will catch on. The concluding words rose in a crescendo of excitement, and, for once, she was blind to the scowl on her companion's face. Matters had come to that pitch, he was furiously resentful of any influence that might lift Lily Paradell into prominence, lest his own dog-in-the-manger policy should be endangered. But he had the sense and good breeding to conceal his feelings for the hour. By Jove, I, I, I congratulate you, Lil, he managed to stammer. Is it a decent sort of song? What's the air like? Oh, it goes with a splendid swing, and it has such a jolly catchword. I'm supposed to be the mind the paint girl. This is the chorus of the first verse. Mind the paint, mind the paint. No matter whether Maple's bills are settled or they ain't. Once you smear it or you scratch it, it's impossible to match it. So take care, please, of the paint, of the paint. Isn't it great? Can't you hear it on the barrel organs? If only I work it up as I think I can, it will go through town like the flu. Jays pulled her out of the way of a noiseless electric brougham. In her enthusiasm, Lily had forgotten her surroundings. Though she was only humming a refrain, her artist's eyes were gazing at a dim and crowded house beyond the footlights. She heard the subdued strains of the orchestra. She watched the conductor's uplifted baton. This was her opportunity, and she must seize it with both hands, now. The motor stole past with silent speed. It had crept too near, and might have knocked her down, but for Jay's prompt help. Yet Lily Paradell was still seeing visions, and being a vivacious young lady, she laughed at the careless chauffeur. Mind the paint, she cried, 
and a bewhiskered face, crowned by a silk hat, was framed for an instant in the Brown's window. Oh dear, she sighed, now I've gone and done it. That was Carlton Smythe. Whatever will he think of me? To her, the manager of the Pandora Theatre was a tremendous deity, throned high on some peak of the Thespian Olympus. In reality, he was a shrewd and cautious judge of public taste in musical comedy, and he was thinking that if the girl would only throw as much animation into the new song on stage as she had displayed in the park, the Duchess of Brixton was safe for a hundred nights at least. See what it is to have a steady-going chap like me handy, said Jays. If I hadn't been just in the right place, you'd have been run over. Nor would I have been singing and generally playing the giddy goat in Hyde Park. Still, I'm awfully obliged to you, Nico dear. You know you come first all the time, no matter what the future may have in store. She flashed a look at him, and such a wealth of tender kindliness poured from her deep blue eyes that his brain reeled. He could not guess, Lily herself could not have told him, that friendship rather than love inspired that thrilling glance. Youth, abounding vitality, the first glimpse of beckoning ambition, such was the formula of the magic elixir coursing through her veins on that bright May morning. It rendered her more than ever desirable. Given her favour, no man could resist her. And Nicholas Jays was a man, though neither bright nor swift of nature. Least of all did he understand women, or he would have known that Lily Paradell was simply brimming over with high spirits and good nature. When she loved, she would die rather than offer her love. Yet it was a moment fraught with possibilities. A breathed word, a caressing pressure of the girl's arm, and the divine spark might have reached the hidden store of passion in Lily's heart. Jay's gloved hands were clenched fiercely. He was on the verge of what he regarded as a social precipice, when an aristocratic dame, leading a Pekingese dog, met the two as they reached the path, and gave him a gracious nod of recognition. "'Who was that?' said Lily, in an undertone. "'Lady Valatort,' muttered Jay's. "'Friend of yours?' Yes, friend of my mother's, to be exact. She didn't forget to look me up and down. You know heaps of people like her, I suppose. Ought you to be walking with me here, Nico? Don't talk nonsense. Why shouldn't I walk with you here or anywhere else? You might have said it was an honour conferred by me, dear boy, but you didn't, and you're right. I'm not in your set. That word set is the most detestable word in the English language. There are others, and we wouldn't use them if they had no meaning. But we're not going to quarrel, Nico, because Lady What's-Her-Name raised her eyebrows. Here are the flowers. How perfectly beautiful. Now I can see what you meant when you said last evening that we Londoners would call the gods to witness that there was nothing in the world to equal them if we saw such a display in Paris. Yet we passed them by unnoticed in dear old foggy London, but who christened them such awful names? Ah, here is something in my line. Don't touch. Keep off the grass. Don't you see? It's another way of telling you to mind the paint. You'll be in town next Monday? Yes, how jolly. I shall feel more at home if I see you in the stalls, grinning like a Cheshire cat and yelling for an encore. Some girls pack the theatre on the first night of a new song just to make it go. But I shan't. I couldn't. If I wanted to ever so, there's only you and Lyle Roper and Bertie Fulkerson, if he hasn't dined too well. Pooh! Bertie Fulkerson, young idiot! Captain Nicholas Jays was himself again, and the North Devon's mess at the Curragh was spared a sensation. But Cupid, perhaps, stole away among the flowers and sulked, until some other youthful pair aroused his interest or sought his sympathy. End of chapter 1